Why don't we take a minute and pray? Heavenly Father, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I know that you have a word for us today. I know that you want to speak deeply into our hearts. You want to communicate a truth to us, Lord, that we would not normally get on our own. So, Father, help us to be able to appropriate that truth, to make it a part of our lives, and for it to become a vehicle to which we become fully devoted followers of Yeshua. Amen. We are continuing our series. Got a little feedback here. Continuing our series... Uh, kings and thrones, relationship, submission, and other stuff. And that other stuff gives me the latitude to talk about a lot of stuff. It all comes out of First and Second Samuel. It's about the life lessons uh, that King David was taught during those time, during that time. And David is a complicated guy. There's a lot of stuff going on in David's life. When we dive into a story, we see that he went from worst to first. He went from being a shepherd to being the king, but it wasn't an easy process. It took a long time. It was a long road. And during that time, God hammered on his character. He taught him lessons that he needed to know. And when we dive into those lessons, it helps us become fully devoted followers of Yeshua. Now, his legacy, and I'm going to sum it up in a, in a line from the movie Black Panther. There's a line in the movie where uh, the Black Panther's father, T'Chaka, says to his son T'Challa, you are a good man, and it is hard for a good man to be king. And this is David's legacy. He is a good man who is a good king. But along the way, he makes mistakes. He's human. He messes up. And that's why we can come alongside of his story and glean from it. We can learn from it, and we can take the things that have happened to, to him and make it a part of our story. So last week, we talked about... Um, we talked about David and Saul and the conflict that they had, how Saul was jealous, how there were times when Saul wanted to kill David, um, and David's reaction to that. So David's reaction to that adversity in his life, how he learned to trust the process. He learned to trust God. He didn't take matters into his own hand. He didn't take the spears that Saul threw at him and throw him back. And for us, that means learning to submit to God's processes, learning to trust him, learning to say, okay, Lord, you're in control and I'm not. This week, I want to talk about relationships uh, in terms of friendship. So when I say the word friendship, I mean, like for me, the first thing that comes to mind is, you got a friend in me, from Toy Story, because we watch like kids stuff all the time, or the Friends TV show, I'm sure you all have seen this, I'll be there for you, and it posts this kind of um, idea of what friendship should be like. It should be fun, and it should be emotional, and there should be some connection. And for many of us, this is not the case. You know, in America, did you know that more than half of the people in America feel lonely? They feel isolated. They feel like they don't have friends. That number goes higher when you apply it to millennials, and it goes even higher when you apply it to Generation Z. So there's a dichotomy going on. We have never been more connected in human history. We have technology at our disposal that allows us to text people and call people and, and, and send them messages and, and FaceTime and we can use WhatsApp when they're in other countries. And we can talk to people whenever we want, but we don't. We don't communicate, we don't connect. And even if we do, those things are not a substitute for the kind of friendship that God wants us to experience in real time, one-on-one -on -one connection. So the, the Yiddish word for it is kesher. It means connection. It means a deep inward drawing of souls together, a connection that goes beyond just, hey, how are you doing? Good to see you at synagogue. Now, the, the, the life of David has this. The life of David has this kind of connection, and it's implicit in the story of David and Jonathan. So if you'll all turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. When we, when we left our hero, um, he was running from Saul, and I, I went in through the story of Saul and how Saul and David had enmity and how Saul was trying to kill David. But in order for us to understand Saul's son, Jonathan, we have to back up a little bit. We have to do a little bit of a zoom out, a rewind, to get back to you the beginning of their relationship. So at this point, David has killed Goliath. 
which is an epic mountaintop moment. And there's a big, huge battle, and lots of blood is shed, but what winds up happening is the Philistines are routed, and David is leading them to victory. This is like colossal, epic, hashtag winning. This is a big, big win for the people of Israel. And it establishes David as a warrior. Everyone can see that this man clearly has the call of leadership on his life. Now, in this moment, the scriptures lead us to the beginning of David and Jonathan's relationship. In uh, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass, when David had finished speaking to Saul, Jonathan's soul was knit to David's soul, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan cut a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped off the robe that was on him and gave it to David along with his armor, his bow, and his belt. Now, at this point, Saul had not yet been jealous. There's, there's kind of a wonderment going on. So David has just accomplished something that no one else in the history of Israel has ever accomplished. And everyone's trying to figure out, what is this guy? What is this angle? And I think in an opportunistic society like ours, especially when it comes to relationships, we would look at a guy like David and say, how can I get him on my side? How can I get him on my team? There's a certain leveraging that happens in our relationships where we like to try and say, okay, this person, um, if, I, if I come alongside of them, they're famous, I can be famous too. We want to associate with the winners and the rock stars and, and the millionaires. And, and, and nowadays, especially with social media, we would take a picture, we're like, can I get a selfie with you? Can I get hashtag David winning? Hashtag I'm winning too. We want to be alongside of those people. But this is different. This moves beyond that superficial relationship. And it goes into something deeper. And the scriptures are showing us not just what happens between David and Jonathan, but a contrast with what would happen between Saul. Whereas Saul was angry and jealous and, and, and kind of consumed by his own ambition and his desire for power, Jonathan does the opposite. He takes off everything that makes him the prince. This is politically dangerous for him. He takes off his armor. He takes off his bow. Listen, these aren't just things that are issued to him in the army. This is the best that the kingdom has to offer. This is the king's son. And the prince is saying, all of this stuff that makes me who I am, I am giving to you. I'm taking off my bow, my royal signet, my royal armor, my... my, my my, my sword, everything that makes me the prince is yours because in my sight, I'm esteeming you equal or higher than myself. This is an emotional moment for me and I'll tell you why. Because many times in my life, I've had this moment, um, not as much as I'd, I'd like, where God has kind of drawn me to a friend. God has said, you need to be friends with this person. And, and put me in a position and reminded me of what Jonathan went through, what Jonathan did, this position of humility. Instead of looking at the other person with suspicion, there was a, a, a natural connection that came. It was supernatural, a supernatural connection, a supernatural friendship. We tend to think in the supernatural in terms of, okay, I'm going to speak in tongues, and I'm going to prophesy, and I'm going to do all this other stuff. But this was supernatural love of God connecting us together, making us one. And usually just for me, and it's different for everybody, it was military guys. So um, my, my friend Devin Marsh is a, is a psychiatrist in the military, and when I met him, he was a captain. And, you know, we were, to, we were friends for a couple of years, and then he got transferred. But in that interim time, I have not had a connection like that since. We are close. We understand each other. He's my older brother. He calls me his little brother. When I have a problem, I call him. And he's in Germany, so it's a little difficult sometimes. At this point in our lives, I can't even call him because I don't know where he is and I, he doesn't have a phone number. But he calls me, he seeks me out. And that has happened to me different times. It's happened to me even here, I'm going to put him on the spot, but P.K. White and I have had this kind of connection. It's strange the way God uses military people in my life specifically. And this model here is what God has led me through. He's led me through this idea that we can be brothers, we can be friends, but we can have a brotherhood. We can have a connection that supersedes what our positions are. It can step us outside of our comfort zones, and we can be honest and emotional and talk things through. You know, for many of us, we don't have these relationships, so the paradigm that I'm going to give to you is, is, is uh, war veterans. 
You know, war veterans can talk to other veterans about things that they can't talk to other people about. So if you have been through a war and you have shed blood with somebody and you have cried on a battlefield and you have watched and grown with these people, that there is a natural connection that you guys have. Now for us as believers in Yeshua, it's a little different because our connection is God and what's happening here is a covenant. They're saying, okay, not only have we gone to war together and not only are we doing these things together, but the God of Israel is the one on whom we are basing our friendship. Now, if you want to understand what a miracle this is and how hard it is to have these kinds of connections, I'm going to give you an example. There's a, a meme floating around on Facebook and nobody talks about Yeshua's miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. Think about it when you're in college. Okay, we're all best friends. I love you, man. And then you graduate college and things get harder. And then you start having your families and you get married and, and life starts happening and people drift apart. But in these moments, this is where these origins of these relationships are so important because you remember why you're together. You remember the reason why you are connected to people. Now, in their case, if you want to understand whether or not this relationship is um, going to survive or not, you're going to um, just introduce a crisis. Just introduce a moment of, of doubt or a moment of um, uh, something that would put a, a friendship at jeopardy. So nothing puts their relationship at jeopardy more than Saul, Jonathan's father. He has it in for David. He, he's jealous of David. He starts plotting David's death, and, and then he, his strategy in the beginning is death by daughter-in-law. He says, I'll let you marry my daughter-in-law for a uh, hundred foreskins. And listen, this is gross. I understand. This is biblical times. We're out of touch here, okay? A hundred foreskins of my enemies. And David, in a kind of, you know, backhanded way, brings him 200 and says, Okay, now I'm ready to marry the king's daughter. And he gives him the king's daughter, Michal, and she is close to him, and they love each other, and Jonathan is his best friend. And all of a sudden, for Saul, from Saul's perspective, in a perspective that wants to keep and hold power, he starts to get extremely jealous. Now, this kind of um, bubbles over into murderous intent. And what Saul starts to do is plot David's death more actively. He commands, I mean, I, I was joking earlier during the sound check that he formed a band called Saul and the Hitmen. <laughs> and he gets his hitmen together and he gets his son together and he says, go to David's house, watch him at night and kill him. But David and Jonathan have a connection and Jonathan says, I'm going to go warn David. So he goes to David and he says, you know, my father's trying to kill you, but let me talk him down. You know, clearly there must be some kind of miscommunication here. And he actively participates in that friendship. So he goes and talks to uh, Saul, and Saul says, you know, all right, fine. Um, I understand what you're saying, and what Jonathan's saying is, you know, he's a great leader of our army. He served you, and he's also killed Goliath, and he's made you look better. So why would you want to kill him? So Saul hears these words, and he says, fine, I won't kill him. But it's a lie. He straight up lies to his son. And then David comes back into the palace, starts serving in the capacity that he had served in, and the evil spirit that we talked about last week that Paul struggled with comes upon Saul again, and, 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 and David picks up the guitar and starts to play because he's the lead guitar player in Saul's band. And Saul takes the spear and throws it at him again because he can't contain his anger and he can't contain his rage and he can't contain his jealousy and it needs a focal point and it's David because you threaten me. So he takes the spear and throws it at him, and David pulls a move out of the matrix and probably just like flies right over his head. But this time, he flees. He runs home to his wife. And his wife is like, yo, Pops is going to kill you. You need to get out of here. I mean, you need to get out of here now. So at night, you know, Saul's hitmen are waiting outside. They're waiting for the morning, but his wife lowers him out of a window, and he escapes into the night. The hitmen come back the next morning, and they're like, Saul wants to talk to David. And she says, well, he's sick. So they go back and they tell Saul. And Saul says, well, then bring him here and kill him. Drag him out of bed. And they go into the bedroom, 
and it's a scene from the Lord of the Rings. I don't know if you've seen it when the, 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 the bad guys come in and they start stabbing the empty beds because the beds are set up and the, the pillows are all positioned. So in this case, it was an idol and she put goat hair on it. She took a page out of the Rebecca playbook and put goat hair all over the, the thing to make it look like it was David. She must have curled that red hair so nice. And then they stabbed it and said, it's wood. So Saul summons his daughter, and he says, why'd you let him get away? And she says, well, he threatened to kill me. So she lies. She lies to cover for him because she loves him. And what you have here is three people who supposedly have a covenant with one another, and there's a great contrast here. Saul says he has a covenant with David because earlier on it said Saul loved David and took him, took him into his house. This is essentially, I'm adopting you. You're going to be like my son. And then Jonathan has a covenant with David, and now David has a marriage covenant with his wife. But two of the people are operating in that kind of covenant faithfulness, and one of them is not, and that's Saul. The story progresses, and David runs, and he runs to Samuel, and he tries to get Samuel's advice. He goes to a place called Ramah, and then um, Saul finds out that he's there, and he sends his hitmen, and the hitmen go there to kill David, and then all of a sudden the Spirit of God falls upon them, and they start prophesying. And they're overcome by the Spirit of God. So Saul sends more hitmen. And the same thing happens. So finally he's like, if you want something done right, you got to go do it yourself, right? So he goes to, to Rama, and the same thing happens to him. God is supernaturally protecting David. He's keeping David safe. Now, the story could have ended here. I mean, between David and Saul and, and the house. And, and, and many of us would look at this and say, this is common sense. I'm just out. I'm done with the family Saul. I, I, I can't be around them anymore. It's too toxic. It's too hard. But this covenant that they made in chapter 18 means something to both of them. They both have that supernatural bond. And it's so powerful that David leaves uh, Rama and Samuel to go find Jonathan. And he comes to Jonathan in chapter 20, verse 1. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and came before Jonathan and said, What have I done? What is my crime? What is my sin against your father that he should be seeking my life? Never, he said to him, you will not die. Behold, my father does nothing great or small without disclosing it to me. Why should my father hide this matter from me? It can't be. Then David swore again, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. So he must have thought, let's not let Jonathan know about this, or else he will be grieved. But truly, as Adonai lives and your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan, Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do to you, do for you. Let's examine this for a minute. Most friendships fall into two categories. Passive and active. Have you heard about this? There are passive friendships and there are active friendships. Most of our friendships are passive. They're people we know at work. They're people we come into contact with. They're people we shake hands with and, and say, okay, you know, we're all at a party and we all got invited to the same party and, you know, some of us are in the co-worker zone and, and some of us are in the family zone and they're just people we make acquaintances with and, and those are appropriate relationships. Not everybody can be your best friend, but there are active relationships. Active relationships have a strong sense of connection. They actively seek each other out. You care about the other person. You take a step outside of your comfort zone. You take a step outside of yourself and actively seek the well-being of the other person. Now, our God is relational. He's a relational God, and he wants us to have relationship with him. And if this passage shows us anything, that he desires us to have relationships with others, that have that kind of a connection, that kind of a strong, almost supernatural bond that can't be broken by circumstances. Um, the idea for active and passive friendships is that we need to pursue the active friendships. Now, I came up with this thing from this passage, and these are called the five signs of an active friendship, and we find them here in this passage. Active friendships seek out connection. So David needed a friend, and he knew it. He sought out his bestie. I mean, you can laugh. That's funny. 
Wow. <laughs> Tough crowd. Active friendships. Listen and speak up when necessary. So what Jonathan does in verse 2 is first David finds him and he says, uh, you know, all of this is going on and I need to talk to you, Jonathan. I need to talk to you because you're the person who gets me. But then Jonathan responds and literally he says, never. And he's kind of saying, you know, snap out of it. Like, you're, are you overreacting? Like, let's talk about this. And he pushes back on him just enough to make him question, maybe for a moment. Saying, okay, you know, are you being hyperbolic here? Do you really think my father's trying to kill you? That's what active friendships do. Active friendships say, listen, I, I have heard you speaking, and this is my input into your situation. Are you sure that this is correct? They give counterbalance. They provide a counter to the other person in whatever emotional state that they're in. Then, the act of friendship is secure enough to express itself. So David says, I hear you, Jonathan. I understand, but this is legit. Your father is trying to kill me. And then Jonathan's response, act of friendship reacts to needs. So Jonathan's response here is telling, and it tells us a lot about their relationship because he says, whatever you say, I will do for you. There's an availability that he's putting out there. He's saying, I want to connect with you. I, I've heard what you've said. You are my friend. Let's talk. Let's fix this. So they hatch a plan. David hatches a plan. He says, my father, I know my father, your father's going to be um, looking for me at the new moon festival tomorrow. And that's like, you know, like an official function, right? It's a big pageant. The king sits down and everyone sits down and all the king's officers sit down and they're supposed to all be at the same table. But David will be noticeably absent, absent because he doesn't want to get a spear thrown at him. So he says to Jonathan, if your father asks where I am, tell him that I went to go see my family for this new moon festival. And if he gets, if he says everything's cool, whatever, you know, I know David will be back, I trust him, then he's not mad, and you're right. But if he gets angry, then I'm right. So they agree to this plan. And he says, well, how am I going to know? And then they hatch up another plan, like a communication system, where uh, Jonathan's going to come back and, you know, do some target practice out in the field, and if the arrows fall in a certain place... The answer is yes, but if the arrows miss their mark, then no, we've missed the mark. And sadly, and unfortunately, David was right. And the two men, they, they come together in this moment in 1 Samuel 20, verse 41, so... David has launched the arrows. He's heard the, uh, Saul, Jonathan has launched the arrows. He's heard the news. There's, there's, a, there's a sadness to this moment where he tells the, the, the boy to go get the arrows and then he sends the boy back into town. He travels with a guy who picks up his arrows. Who doesn't do that? As soon as the lad was gone, David emerged from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed there three times. They kissed each other and wept together, though David wept more. Then Jonathan said to David, Go and shalom, that we have both sworn to each other in the name of Adonai, saying, May Adonai be between me and you, between my offspring and your offspring forever. Listen, this is really the last time that they connect. It doesn't happen again until 1 Samuel 23, and it's just for a short instance, and they reaffirm the covenant, and David stays in a cave, and Jonathan goes back home to fight with his father, and the family Saul dies on Mount Gilboa. It's awful. All of the, it's a carnage. The Philistines come in, and they wipe out Saul's family. But this relationship endures. It sticks together. Even after death, what, Jonathan, what, what uh, David says about Jonathan in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, on the loss of his friend Jonathan. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasing were you to me. Wonderful was your love to me more than the love of woman. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war destroyed. We can't say these things in the culture that we live in today because it's not safe for men especially to express themselves in this manner because people will think that they're gay. 
And a lot of people who will hear this will think that they're, they were gay. There's this like deep emotional bond. They're hugging, they're kissing each other. Listen, that's a cultural thing, right? Turks hug and kiss each other all the time. There's a lot of hugging and kissing. Go to a Messianic rabbi's uh, forum and, and see somebody you haven't seen in a while. Oh, that's the kind of kissing they're talking about. And I think that in the society we live in, we're kind of afraid of these kinds of relationships because they, they might expose us. They might force us to tell the truth. They might to- force us to show who we really are and what's really going on inside of our lives. And that kind of brings us to the, the fifth dynamic of relationships. The fifth dynamic. Active friendships express emotion. It's a safe place to be able to talk about what's going on. It's a safe place to be able to share. So uh, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a man, and it's not specific to men, but for men, the truth is, a lot of these resources don't exist. A lot of these resources that show us as men to be able to connect with other men are not out there. There are lots of books written from the perspective of, uh, especially Bible-based books that are written by female counselors about women connecting to other women. But for men, it's kind of like, well, I can't cry in front of you because then you're going to think like I'm weird and, you know, we like this awkward space between us and guys don't like to talk anyway, so there's this kind of barrier. But that's not an active friendship. An active friendship actively seeks the good of the other person. See, there are friendships that are happening in this room. There are friendships that are happening to everybody out there. And some of those relationships are passive, and they're on the outside. But God wants you to be able to connect with some of those people, not all of them, maybe a handful of them, on a deeper and more intimate level. But for us, the hard part is we like the isolation. We like to not expose ourselves. Now, the best way I can explain this is through headphones. You're going to laugh, but bear with me. I, uh, I recently lost my Beats noise-canceling headphones, and I didn't realize how much I needed them until after, uh, until after they were gone because I started to go back to work in a coffee shop, and then all of a sudden I just hear everybody and every conversation, and everything's kind of streaming into my ears, and I, I'm like sitting here trying to go like, Baruch Atat and I, I can't write the sermon because there's all this noise coming in. So I kind of went on this journey, and I said, well, I lost my headphones, but I'm going to try and figure this out, so um, I'll use these. These are my shooter's muffs, right? These are construction grade. They block out all noise. If I put these things on, no lie, not only will I not hear anything, all I will hear is myself. If I'm still enough, I can hear my own heartbeat. I can literally feel my own voice reverberating inside of my head. It's taking the sound waves and just trapping them. And I am in complete and total sound isolation. I can hear very little of what's going on outside of me. So that was not going to work for me because I have little kids and I need to be able to hear something, right? Like I need to be able to hear, okay, the building's on fire, you need to go. (laughs) And they're great for what they do, but don't necessarily fit the bill. So these are my Apple earpods. You can all go, ooh, it's Apple candy, right? And these are great because they're convenient. You put them in your ears, and they don't really block out any noise, but they look really cool. <laughs> no wire, no nothing, right? And they're the legit Apple ones. I mean, I, I bought the real ones. I didn't buy the fake and bacon ones that are on Amazon for 30 bucks. These were expensive, and I thought this would fix my problem. But really, the only way that I can get away from noise in these is to pump up the volume as loud as I can, and it still comes in. There's like a, a level of, okay, th- this is a good tool, and it's a, little, it's a little bit of a superficial experience with noise, but it just kind of pumps into my ears, and I can control it, and it's what I need, but it doesn't really work. It doesn't really fit the bill. Now, these bad boys... I bought another pair of Beats. My birthday was on Saturday. It was on Monday. 
And my wife was like, we're not even talking about what you need because I'm sick and tired about hearing about headphones. I'm buying you a pair of headphones. I'm like, are you sure? And these are great because you turn them on and they have this, this technology in them that's called active noise cancellation. So when I put them on, there are two microphones that are built into the side of the headphones and one microphone does something called destructive interference. And it takes the background noises that are bad and the things that, that kind of drive you crazy like on a plane or when your kids are upstairs, you know, like <laughs> and talking and talking and talking. And it emits a frequency that destroys that noise. And then there's another microphone on the other side. And the other microphone does this thing called constructive interference. It takes sounds that it deems that are helpful and amplifies them and brings them to the volume that you need. So on an airplane, you would be able to lose the drone of the airplane. And you know how annoying that is. I don't know if you guys travel a lot, but man, when you're on a plane and you want to sleep and everyone else is asleep and all you can hear is <laughs> in the background, these puppies are gold. They are gold. I'm not saying go out and buy a pair of headphones, but the Beats are very comfortable. And it, so there are two kinds of interference, and I think that a lot of us treat relationships in this way. We're either in the isolation chamber, and we're afraid of what other people will think of us, and we're afraid of what others are going to say about us, and we've been burned and we've been betrayed and we say, okay, I, I don't want this in my life. I don't want these relationships in my life. It would be better to be alone and be trapped and only hear my own heartbeat and only hear my own voice because it's better than being hurt. Some of us, you know, maybe move out of that isolation booth and move on to something a little bit less effective. So we find relationships and we find friendships and we keep them in a certain place and we allow them to exist superficially so that we can have just the right amount for us you know uh, doesn't make us uncomfortable amount of socialization and, and we can talk and relate to other people and you know sometimes I need to crank it up but other times I need to turn it down but really that background stuff is still there and it's still piping into my ears and I have to learn to live with it and there are very few of us who move on to this step. There are very few of us who move on to the step of saying, okay, I need a friend in my life that helps emit a frequency that will destroy those other background noise, that unwanted noise, the unwanted noise of, like, my past, my shame, my pain, the things that I carry. One that will say, that frequency over there that's constructive, you need that elevated in your ears. You need that elevated in your mind and your heart. It moves us out of isolation and into a place of hearing, not just the other person, but hearing from God, because there are relationships that God wants us to have where he's going to speak into our lives, and he's going to use other people to do it. And if we're in this place of saying, I don't want to talk to anybody because my problems are bad, and if I come to you with my problems and I start telling you, you're going to look at me and you're going to, you're going to be like, that guy's unbalanced, or, or that guy's you know, weird. I think you would be surprised at how many people want that kind of connection in their lives, but they're afraid to take a step out of that isolation booth. They're afraid to let go of what they have, the superficial element of their relationships. But God desires us to be friends with one another, to have that kind of connection. He wants to be our friend. And he wants to pour love into us. And as that love gets poured into us, he wants it to be made manifest to the rest of the world around us. It says in John 15 that they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. That's the hallmark of what we should be. That points back to David and Jonathan. This is who God wants us to be. This is how God wants us to walk. United with him, loving others. Loving ourselves, really in a helpful, helpful way. In a healthy and helpful way. Listen, that's not going to happen in the isolation. It's not going to happen in the isolation tank. I know we live in Seattle, and, and we like the Seattle freeze, and we like the distance in our relationship, 
I mean, it's really kind of easy to kind of live here in some ways if you don't like emotional connection, because honestly, nobody wants to talk to each other. But when I go into the supermarkets where I come from in New Jersey, people are like a little bit too much, you know what I mean? Like they just come on and they come on strong and they start talking to you like they've known each other. And some of those people, honestly, will become your lifelong friend. Not all of them, but some of them. I'm saying that there has to be a spot for us as we become fully devoted followers of Yeshua to be able to take a step away from what's comfortable for us and into what God wants us to be, from where we are to where he wants us to be. I want to encourage all of you to ask the Lord and say, listen, I really, some of this is like resonating with me. Sometimes all I can feel is my own heartbeat and my own voice ringing inside my ears and the things that I'm hearing are depressing or, or, or making me angry or frightful or fearful and it's just replaying the past over and over again on the loop. And some of you are, are sitting here and you're saying, you know what, some of these relationships that I have are just not cutting it. They're just not cutting it. I don't really feel like I'm going deep enough with people. There's something. I want more. I want more depth. I want more of God. Yes, I understand that. But I need more people. Listen, take a step out of those two places. Start asking God regularly. Whose life can I be a part of? How can I be a blessing to somebody? How can I be a blessing to somebody else? Listen, you, you, can't, you can't just have friends. You need to be a good friend. There's a balance. It's not just, you know, you come to me. We don't treat people like it's a contract. That's the difference between a contract and a covenant. A, co a contract is just a transaction. I paid last time, it's your turn. I came to your house last time, it's your turn. Listen, I understand, friendships need balance and all that other stuff. But if that's the focal point of your friendships, then I'm, I'm just being straight up honest with you. You're probably not a good friend. But you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay in that place. There's a deep, rich, extravagant love that God wants to pour out in our hearts. But it's not just for us. It's so that others would have it. So that it would be available. So that it would not only bring joy and love to me and joy and love to you, but that it would bring glory to our Creator. The one who created us, the one who watches from heaven and ordains our relationship. He sets our times. He sets our seasons. And yes, he sets our relationships. And there are steps that we need to take outside of these comfort zones in order to become all God wants us to be. Listen, here at Restoration, these things are going to happen for you in connect groups. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just being straight up. This is not going to happen. It's really not going to happen here on Saturday. It's going to be really rare. But if you take that step, where it's saying, okay, I want to be more intimate with God and more intimate with others, and I want to be a part of the framework of what God is doing here in this congregation and in my life, really, as a reciprocation of that. You've got to get off your tuchus and go to a group. And when you do that, you're going to experience a richness. Listen, it might be awkward in the beginning, especially if you're, like, super introverted and you don't like dealing with people and, you know... But there's a, there's, a, there's a unity that God wants to bring for each and every one of us that will decisively change the course of our lives. You know, in David's case, his relationship with Jonathan went past Jonathan and it went on to Jonathan's grandson. I'm not going to pronounce his name. It's really hard. And he cared for the grandson. You know, when his kingdom was established, he thought in his mind, how can I care for the household of Saul? Think about that. There's no greater offense than you and I have ever lived through. No one's ever thrown spears at us physically. No one's ever plotted our death and tried to do death by daughter-in-law. But in his case, the love of God and the love that he had with his friend and the friendship that he had superseded even the offense and became something that lasted generations. And listen, this is all conjecture, but I have no doubt out there because of the covenant that they cut that somewhere a descendant of David is throwing his arm around a descendant of Jonathan. 
I'd like to think that. And honestly, I want to think that for my own kids. I want to think that the relationships that I'm forging now and the relationships I'm stepping into now are relationships that are going to benefit my children. They're going to be part of the legacy. They're part of Jonathan's legacy. They're part of David's legacy. Do a search on biblical friendship. First thing come up, David and Jonathan. God wants this for your life. He wants this for you. Take a step into it. Put your guard down. Be vulnerable. Listen, God's got your back. Even if it goes south a couple times, it's okay. God can walk you through that too. Let me pray for you. Lord, you are great and mighty and awesome, God, and and you are able to speak clearly to us in a way that oftentimes we can't even perceive. Father, I know you spoke today. I know that this is a message you wanted people to get. And Father, I know that there are relationships and friendships that, that people even in this room and people listening have going on. They're superficial now, but you want to elevate those relationships. You want to make them more. You want to have a deeper and richer connection between these people because it gives you glory and it gives you pleasure. And when we're united in you and two or more together, there you are all, are also. And that's just not a prayer thing. That's a fellowship thing. And we, we know that you want to be in our midst, Father. But if we're isolated and alone and it's just you and us, it's a cheapening. It's not as deep as it could be. Father, I pray that you would identify the people that you want to have in this kind of relationship, that you would speak to them, that you would supernaturally draw them to one another, and that you would pour out your spirit on that bond and make it their legacy. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you that this can be found in connect groups. We we pray for the growth of our groups. We pray for the growth of our group leaders, and we pray for the growth of our groups, and we pray for more deepness and more richness to come out of these groups as I believe that they will, Lord, because we are calling upon you to do it. Father, give us the obedience to follow through on your plan for our lives. In Yeshua's name, amen.